So it's a, it's a symbol of, of wealth and position to have ivory objects in your home, um, wearing them, whatever. So we're in big trouble because they're, you know, this awfully big country and they, they are rich, they have money, and they, have, um, they haven't yet had their consciousness raised about what, why that an elephant has to die to, uh, to um, provide its ivory. In fact, um, the International Fund for Animal Welfare that we work closely with, they have an office in, uh, in Beijing, and they did a survey a few months ago and 84% of the people asked thought that elephants shed their tusks, they didn't die. So we have a big job ahead of us to try to change the attitudes and, of, the, of the people. And in the meantime, we're losing elephants at a terribly fast rate. Now we were, we, this elephant was poached actually inside the park. It was the only one we had poached inside, a young male. And uh, we had others being poached outside. And because so many elephants were dying naturally, the people around there started picking up the ivory and selling it. And then they realized, oh, this is a good thing. So they started killing them to sell it. So we had that along with the, the deaths to the drought, due to the drought. And this is, um, they, they found a car near Ambaselli with uh, a lot of ivory. And that's one of my, assistance having the inspecting at Soila, she's my deputy director. And this was in the Ambasali headquarters. So those were pretty fairly big tusks. Those are definitely you see a female here. These are female tusks, it's long. That's a, those are males. Those are males. The males taper more. Um, anyway, a lot of elephants died just for that one. and there have been so many confiscations and um, Anyway, so it goes on. So the, during that year, the 2009, 83% of the wildebeest died. That was, there were something like 17,000 wildebeest in the Roma. 71% you know. of the zebras, 61% of the buffaloes, and 24% of the elephants. And of the elephant losses, um, we had about 385 died in 2009. And 96 of these were adult females. This was devastating for the families. 27 of them were matriarchs. Just, you can just imagine what, what that did to the families. They were, you know, that some of those families had been led by those matriarchs for the last 30 years or more. And then all the old females died. 57% of the calves born in 2008 and 2009 died. So it was, um, it was a very bad time for all, for the elephants and for us recording this because there was nothing we could do. You know, there, there's, there wasn't enough hay in all of Kenya to feed all those elephants. There's no way you could intervene. You just had to watch and it was, it was hard. But finally, uh, and that was right through December 2009, and then finally in January 2010, we started getting clouds, and then we finally got some rain. And the um, the amazing thing about about savannas, about African savannas, is and it never ceases to amaze me. I've been I've been living in Kenya or Tanzania now for 44 years, but this never ceases to amaze me, the, the ability of a savanna to recover. And um, she, it gets down to the stubble, it's just dust and a little bit of stubble on the ground in a, in a drought. And then you get some rain and like three months later, <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that just wonderful? So same here, the vultures in the trees, they're very heavy, fat vultures, and then it rains, and there it is. So it, it does, it is an amazing habitat, the, uh, the savanna. So then um, very soon, elephants were up to their knees in grass, and very happy indeed, and they were able to mud wallow and have a good time. And uh, 
the males started coming into must again. When you have to be, in order to come into must, uh, an elephant has to be in very good shape, it has to be very fat, have a lot of body fat reserves. And um, this is one of our biggest elephants. His name is Tim, and he's in full must here. And this was after the rains came. So he, so the big males started coming into the park again and looking for females uh, because they had probably, certainly not made it at all in 2009 and, and not very much in 2008 either because everyone, with, with elephants, if they get in, if they lose weight, if they lose body condition and lose body fat reserves, the females stop cycling. Just like, just as human females who are marathon runners and everything, they, they stop cycling as well because their fat reserves are so low that they, um, that they can't, that they need that, that fat to, to, get it, to get the whole cycle going. So the males started coming in and this, this um, lucky female had four suitors. This is Eudora from the, and she he had these lovely big, she had these four big males. Looking, looking after her. She looks very coy. <laughs> and, this, and this is Tim again, and he managed to get two at the same time, which was really lucky. <laughs> but Lotus and Lynx from the LA family in there. Um, and see, they have little cows. Just to, these are about two and a half years old, which is just the right age for them to come into estrus again and start mating. So. Tim was, Tim was, does very well for himself. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's a mating. And um, matings in elephant society are, n are not um, private affairs at all. <laughs> Every, everybody joins in, the whole family, the whole family joins in. So this is a young female. This was Kit. And, um, and this is her mother come rushing over. <laughs> and then there's lots of screaming and rumbling and, and uh, special special rumbles that the female makes after she's made it, which actually attracts more males. So that in the end, she gets the, any any of the best and the biggest male around. We have always been involved in. Um, in training the scout, scouts, these local Maasai scouts who, who become uh, who, who become a force, an anti-poaching force. So we do the training, and we, this is me, and that's Soila Sayalel, who's my deputy, and Nora, who's the, uh, and Jirani, who's the training coordinator. And, um, and this was a, a team of, of scouts that we trained. Um, not we didn't tra we only train them in elephant stuff. They also get trained very good training in, in military sort of training to be anti poaching people. <coughs> and um, after a while, another organization helped us. They were helping us with the scouts for a while, and then realized that they really needed to bring in a lot of money to to help these community scouts all around Apicelli. There are about almost 280 of them on the group branches around Apicelli. So it's an, an organization called Big Life Foundation, which was started by a photographer named Nick Brandt. And he brought in big money and, and bought the Land Rovers and set up um, eight uh, anti-poaching camps and um, bought them uniforms and boots. And, and um, ever since he's done that, we've, the poaching has gone way down. We only get a little, we're still getting some, but not, you know, but it's so much less than it was in 2009 and 2010. So, um, so we're quite happy. Now I showed you the, uh, the map of Amboseli and how the elephants actually don't stay in the park. They spend a lot, you know, even more of their time outside, and they have a very large range. And we realized also that there was, there was development going on around the park, you know, new lodges and various things happening. And we realized that we had to find out exactly which, which routes the elephants were taking in and out of the, the park and when they went out into their, into their greater range. And so as much as we don't like to do any kind of invasive research, and by that I mean 
You know, we do completely non-invasive, which is staying back and watching animals. We don't interact with them. And, um, but we, we decided that we had to put aside that, um, you know, that proviso and actually do some radio collaring of elephants because we, we desperately needed to know where the corridors were, or you know, we thought we knew, but we had to actually prove it, and um, and where it was very very necessary to keep places wild. So um, so we last uh, let's see, it was um, July 2011. We got a fantastic team of um, experts together. Um, these were um, Danish guy named. Hendrik Rasmussen, this is, and he is actually the one who um, makes the collars and all the technical things. These, these collars run off, rather than run off satellites, which is very expensive, they run off the um, telephone towers all around the, 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 play, the, the ecosystem. And uh, so he was, so here he is fitting one of, one of the collars. So we got this great team, all of us on the project, Henrik, a very, very good, and Max Graham, who's, who's, a, who's a, a colleague and has, has a radio collar dozens of elephants up in the Mount Kenya area. And this, this is the vet, the KWS vet, who's the best darter. Of, you know, he darts with a gun with M99. He's so accurate and so good. And he has the most wonderful name, it's Ephantus. We <laughs> think that's, <laughs> but that's his first name. Anyway, so, so we went out, and I, I get very nervous about doing this. I just, I hate, I hate it because I'm so frightened that something's gonna happen, and I'll feel so guilty. And, uh, but we had the, the most amazing luck. Uh, we had, we were planning on doing five females from five different families that we knew went in more or less in all four directions outside the park. And we thought it would take us two and a half to three days. Well, we did all five of them in one morning, which turned out to be a complete record for radio collaring. But the, the team was so good that it, and it went so smoothly that um, you know the elephant was never down for more than 20 minutes or 25 minutes. So this was the first one. This is Ida, and you can see her collar, and she's just wet, woken up. There she is, and she's she's wet because when they're down, you have to keep pouring um, water over them to make sure they don't get hot, so that they always wake up. Uh, with and that was Lobelia. She's, she just got up in this, and then she's feeling her collar, and that's usually it. You know, they'll feel their collar. That when they get up and then they never pay any attention to it again. And that's Vicky, who's been radio collared before. So she, she, in fact, we took her old collar off and put that one on. And she, uh, so she's an old hand at radio track, a radio collaring. And that's Maureen, and that's a Willow, and that was the the most amazing. Um, she had, that's her mother here. This is Winnie, who worked her mother. And this is Willow's calf here. And, then, and the, the rest of the family are always, they never go away, they never leave the female. You know, she, she, she eventually falls down and they sometimes try to pick her up and you have to go immediately and chase them away so she, they don't hurt her trying to, trying to pick her up. But they never, they, even though it's a scary event and there are cars and people on the ground, they never abandon her. They only go, you know, 50 meters, 75 meters away at the most, and then they wait. Now, even though they don't know what's happening, I mean, this family's never been radio collared before. So then, when um, when Willow woke up, and uh, I guess she turned and probably called. We can't we often can't hear, and they came running over. It was the most amazing greeting. Where Winnie was, her mother was so excited about. It finding her again. And they've been fine, you know, the next time we saw them a couple days later, they acted as if nothing had ever happened. So it was altogether very successful and I felt didn't feel <laughs> didn't have to feel guilty.